My name is Seth McGowan. I'm the current president of the organization, and I'll be hosting uh, tonight's uh, tonight's presentation. We're facilitating, and frankly, once my beginning section is over, uh, you won't hear much from me again until the end. So, um, the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory is located in uh, Tupper Lake, New York, and it's a Tupper Lake is not necessarily known to a lot of people. So the question is, well, why Tupper Lake? Well, we are located uh, in the heart of the Adirondacks. If you're not uh, familiar with us already, we're, we're right in the middle there um, in, in that dark circle. And uh, the, the benefit for that, of course, is that uh, we have incredibly dark skies, which is a, a, a great benefit one of the few places in the uh, in the east that is as dark as we are but more importantly we have visitors from all around um, uh, on our stargazing nights uh, people coming up for astrophotography or just general observation and you can see from these uh, this large area there's many cities and all of them are are flooded with uh, with bright lights in the city. So we are the crossroads of the Adirondacks, as uh, as they call it. And, uh, and being so dark, we're a great draw for people who uh, want to enjoy the dark skies. So what is it that we do? Our goal is to make the universe accessible for everybody. Um, un unlike most of the uh, guests that we have doing these pr uh, presentations, we don't need to be an astrophysicist in order to enjoy the night sky. We're an, a, a nonprofit organization, and uh, we we concentrate on making the wilderness above uh, part of everybody's everyday experience. We conduct free public observing programs as often as the sky allows us to. We start with a presentation um, and then we move on to looking at uh, through the telescopes inside the building. Uh, we do private stargazing parties like this birthday party for this young man who's, uh, who's looking through the telescope with his mom and dad taking pictures. We take our portable planetarium to schools all over the area um, and uh, most cases we see every every student in the school uh, district we could be there for you know uh, from anywhere from a single day to five days uh, we've been uh, at a school to see every single student and that portable planetarium shows uh, a, a night sky um, as if they would see it right from their backyard we all do we do other stem related uh, programs and here's uh, just a, a little bit of a, a demonstration of how the earth uh, how the earth's rotation and tilt affects what we see we have a number of after school programs uh, especially uh, during the, the uh, fall and the spring and as well as summer programs this was a, a program on telescope making and you're here tonight for our uh, Cygnus series of virtual live uh, lectures that started as a result of COVID and wound up being uh, immensely popular. So we've just kept on doing it. We'll start to do some uh, in-person as well as hybrid versions of this as well. So what's planned for us down the road is this planetarium. Uh, part of a larger project, um, we started, uh, we decided to concentrate on this very next phase of the planetarium. And you can see that the, the full plan is the full Astro Science Center, but uh, we currently have the Roloff Roof Observatory where we do our public programs. And for the moment, we're concentrating only on this phase, the planetarium phase um, that will be uh, fully digital and uh, state-of-the-art technology with a classroom and a, a lecture hall attached to it so we can do a number of other activities and uh, art shows and, and so forth. A little rendering of what the, uh, what the inside of the planetary might look like. So if you're interested, um, I'm not telling you that for no reason, if you're interested in, uh, uh, in donating to the planetarium construction fundraising, uh, we'd be happy to talk to you more about that. You can go directly to that link or send us an email or uh, give us a phone call. Uh, upcoming events, though, we, of course, um, have arranged for the moon to pass in front of the sun on April 8th, 2024, and uh, Tupper Lake is right in the path of totality 
uh, for three minutes and 33 seconds. Um, so it's going to be quite an event here in Tupper Lake. We're, uh, we, we've got a community-wide uh, spirit about it. So in addition to us, the, the library, the village and the town, the Wild Center, the schools, the uh, Tupper Arts, we're all creating a community-wide event here uh, for anybody who wants to come up for that. And I expect there'll be tons of people that come up for that. Uh, not too far down the road in October is our annual astrophotography conference. This is where you can learn uh, to take your skills to the next level, whether you're a beginner or whether you're already advanced. Um, you can uh, expand your skills with our very hands-on approach. Uh, this is not a sit and lecture type of a thing. This is a your equipment and your, uh, your images and your processing kind of a thing. So... Uh, we, we set up in the evening, we take, uh, we do imaging in the evening, and then we go back into the classroom and uh, we help you process those images from beginning to end. So uh, tonight is our uh, presentation uh, with Dr. Josh Thomas. Next uh, June 1st, on June 1st, uh, Gib Brown will be here for a presentation. Um, so uh, keep a lookout for those. And uh, our, our uh, featured program tonight is the, well, our, our main program, our only program tonight is, uh, is, is uh, the dust rings in space. So before you, we begin, though, uh, you'll notice that our microphones are muted. Uh, we will, like I said, have Q&A after the presentation, as always. And of course, this presentation will be available on our YouTube channel within a couple of days. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to introduce our guest uh, speaker tonight, Josh Thomas, who's Associate Professor and Director of the Observatory uh, in, in the Department of Physics at Clarkson University. Um, Josh obtained his doctorate in physics at the University of Toledo in 2012. His research area is astrophysics, and his specialty is observational stellar spectroscopy. Josh also has experience in accelerated-based atomic physics and computational astrophysics. He draws on this breadth of experience in advising many undergraduate students in research as well as in public school uh, science outreach. Re recently, his focus has been on studying various types of binary stars at various stages of their life. We like him especially because he's a member of the board of directors for the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory. And I'm sure you will like him too. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Josh Thomas. Josh, take it away. Thank you, Seth. Uh, give me a second to do the thing. <laughs> Maybe, oh, share. All right, does it look good, Seth? It looks great. All right, uh, okay. I'm gonna do one more thing and let's put the chat where I can kind of see it, okay. So um, thank you for that introduction, Seth. And uh, yeah, so dust rings in space. Uh, you may have seen uh, this background image here. Um, this is an image that was taken by uh, the James Webb Space Telescope and was released, um, I don't know, a little while ago, but maybe about a year ago. And, um, you know, I remember seeing these pop popular news articles that were like, astronomers baffled by smoke rings in space and i was like yeah that's not baffling astronomers know exactly what that is um as i've done actually uh, research on this star so what i'm going to do today is uh i'm going to of course present the picture here but i'm also going to um uh talk a little bit about my own research and how my own research plays a role in our understanding of uh picture uh, uh, under our, uh, our understanding of things that have been imaged with James Webb. So um, Seth already did a nice little uh, introduction about me. Uh, so I won't say too much more other than uh, I am a rocket scientist for those that know the University of Toledo's the uh, rockets. Um, and uh, this is my group uh, of students from this past summer. Um, so I had uh, Carly who actually took this color picture on the left here of uh, I think this one is IC5076, and then uh, Anthony and Michaela and John, and uh, John and Michaela are graduating uh, this semester, and Carly is graduating with her master's degree. So, um, all right, so 
uh, for our talk, uh, the obligatory outline slide for academics. Uh, no one else really cares, but uh, we're talking <laughs> a lot about background. And uh, then we'll move on and, and talk a little bit about WR 140 and what it is and, and uh, how it fits into all of this. Uh, maybe it's worth pointing out while I'm on this image. Um, of course, there's the, the ring-like structures you see, which is uh, stuff related directly to the star, and we'll talk about that. But you'll also notice uh, these sort of, well, I don't know what color you call that, bluish perhaps, uh, this sort of snowflake pattern. There's one, two, three, four, five, six of these, and then there's something else going on. But there's six of these, and that's actually caused by the uh, support structure for the secondary mirror of James Webb. So if I go two slides ahead here, um, this is a picture of a 14 inch plane wave telescope that I installed this last summer at uh, Clarkson here. So it's a what we call a reflecting telescope. So the light comes in this end, reflects off the mirror, big mirror in the back, comes back up, reflects off the secondary, back through this thing that looks like a shower cap. It's covering a hole that goes through to the camera at the back. And uh, you'll notice the secondary mirror is held in place with this uh, like cross-shaped uh, crossbar. And that produces the types of diffraction spikes that you see here in this uh, image here. So there's uh, one for each um, arm, basically. Um, a single, like if you had a single piece of metal, it would make just a straight line. If you have two, it makes a straight line that's brighter. If you have uh, two that are at an angle like this, you actually get the, a cross shape, but it's not quite as bright. If you've got the full on cross, it's brighter. And if you have three <laughs> uh, supports for your uh, secondary mirror, like the James Webb, you end up producing that uh, snowflake pattern. Um, so that's a little bit about, uh, that is just a, 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 what's called a, uh, so they're diffraction spikes and they're the result of how the telescope is made. So they're not part of the object. Um, so uh, the next little thing I like to throw in is uh, well, how I view what I do. So what I do is I want to understand the universe. Uh, and you guys are all sitting in a room somewhere at home, right? And there's something across the room and you want to understand something about it, like maybe how massive it is or uh, what its temperature is or what color it is, right? Well, except for the color part, you can get up and you can weigh the object or you could go stick a thermometer on it, right? But in astronomy, we are stuck in our chair. We are stuck on the earth. So we can't get up and go across the room and study these other things. We have to be very clever in find other ways to figure out what are the masses of these things, their temperatures, what are they made of, um, and what's the environment around them like. So that's what I hope to do uh, is to put some of this all in context about how we can study outer space. Uh, there's a nice pun on the slide if you get it. So um, moving on. Um, I, so I did a lot of this work actually with a smaller telescope than the one on the screen. Um, it comes up in two slides. Um, but I did that with uh, a lot of collaborators. So we published this paper in 2021 where we wanted to understand the masses of the stars in the WR140 system. So actually the stars that you can't even see in that uh, image are actually, it's actually a binary. So there's two stars orbiting each other. And so we want to know what their masses are and maybe some other properties. Um, the blue boxed names are all amateur astronomers, um, meaning they're not paid to do astronomy professionally. Um, and they all have spectrographs. Most of them are in Europe. One of them is in Canada. Um, the red boxes were students that worked with me at Clarkson on this. So uh, all of their telescopes are, you know, 14 inches, maybe 16 inches at the largest. So these are relatively small telescopes. So I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is, you know, you don't need to be James Webb to be playing a port, an important role in science. So uh, this was the telescope that I actually used uh, for collecting about 160 spectra over the course of a few months uh, to study this star. So that's actually for those that can tell, there's actually two pictures, two telescopes here. There's the little yellow one, which is a five inch telescope. And then there's the blue telescope here, which is a 12 inch telescope. And so the light comes in this end, reflects off the primary mirror, off a secondary, comes back through a hole. 
And then we've got this black box. This literal black box is the spectrograph. And the light will first uh, come into the spectrograph and will first hit this thing I call the slit plate. Um, so you'll, this is a very shiny thing. You'll see this, this is actually the uh, reflection of my cell phone camera. The little white bar you see here is actually the ceiling light in the lab where I took this picture. And then depending on your monitor, you may or may not be able to see this very, very thin black line. That thin black line is about the thickness of a human hair. And what we want to do is place the star right on top of that little slit and make sure it stays there so that the light goes through that slit into the camera or into the spectrograph. So in this case, we've got this little blue camera. We use that to make sure the star stays on the slit. The, the light goes through the slit, off some mirrors, and then comes down here to the business end. So this thing here, this is the back of it, or uh, the inside of it looks like this. Um, this is what's called a diffraction grating. This is the thing that breaks the light up into the rainbow. Uh, if you've ever looked at the back of a CD or a DVD, if you're old enough to know what those are, uh, they break up light, they make a rainbow. They work very similar to uh, this here. So these um, are these have a lot more scratches on them than a CD does, Let's, if you want to think about it that way. Um, but it's uh, the same idea. And then the light, uh, the rainbow is then uh, going to hit this camera here. Uh, and that camera is actually turns out to be monochrome. We're not going to talk too much about the details of that, but it only looks at a very tiny piece of the rainbow at any given time. And you'll see that when we look at things later here. So um, that is a little bit of that background. And where I want to go next is to talk about how we use this type of equipment to stare at stars and figure out their properties without, of course, leaving our chair. So I want to do like a little bit of high school chemistry, uh, but don't worry, there's not a quiz. So uh, you may be familiar with cartoon pictures of atoms that look something like this. I went to Pixabay and typed in atom, and after three pages, I finally found this. Um, so atoms have protons and neutrons in their core. And then the important part that I care about are the electrons that are whizzing around the outside. Um, it turns out electrons uh, that are, you could think of them classically as orbiting uh, the, the nucleus, um, they only do so at certain so-called energy levels. And you could think of those energy levels like bookshelves. So the books are like electrons and the shelves are like the energy levels. If you put a book on this shelf and you like, if your book is like here and you let go of it, it'll fall down to, to the shelf. Meaning it can only exist on the shelf. Uh, the analogy kind of doesn't work perfectly after that, but basically you can take one book from a sh one shelf to another shelf, uh, but it, it has to end up on a shelf. Uh, if we were in a room right now, what I would do is I would have a book and I would just drop it. And when the book goes from here to the ground, of course, it makes a loud thud. That is the equivalent to what's happening in light. When the electron goes from one level down to a lower level, it gives off light. And that's the light that tells us about the atom. And it turns out the spacing and size of these shelves is unique to each atom. So. In spectroscopy, there's sort of three flavors. There's so-called emission or bright line spectra, continuous or rainbow or black body spectra, absorption or dark line spectra. And I've got pictures of those here on the left. So um, this is a bright line spectrum, continuous and uh, so-called dark line. Uh, my little cartoons here explain sort of the physical origin. So if you don't really care about that, you can tune out. Uh, but if you have a hot glowing gas and you look at it with the spectrometer, you see the bright emission. Now, of course, in astronomy, we don't want to look at pretty rainbows. We want to look at little wiggly lines. So if you imagine that everywhere you see brightness in this image, the brightness is this vertical axis. And me moving my mouse left and right, that's the wavelength direction. And so each of these lines, it's not the color of the line that's important. It's where the line is that's important. That's the wavelength. And so uh, each atom would have an, an, a unique set of these uh, wavelengths. 
Um, if you just looked at a hot glowing object, like if you have an electric stove and your the coils heat up and start to glow red, um, that's what's called a continuous or black body spectrum and would result in all of the colors, the rainbow. Um, technically, depending on how hot it is, it would be more blue or more red, but uh, with your electric stove, you're never going to see that. <laughs> um, maybe if you're doing some uh, forging, perhaps. Now, if you put these two things together, if you have a hot glowing object that produces all the light and you put some gas in front of it, and if technically speaking, if that gas is cooler, um, it will absorb instead of emit at those exact same fingerprints. So what happens is the light that's coming through here actually takes one of those books from a low shelf and moves it to a high shelf. So it takes that light out of the spectrum, leaving behind a dip or a dark line. All right, so that's the key thing. Um, and uh, there's an equation on the slide. Uh, you can ignore all my equations if you don't like them, that's fine. Um, they're not needed. Um, we measure uh, the other, this is a reminder to myself to mention the words Doppler effect. Um, and if you've ever been pulled over by the police, you know all about the Doppler effect. Um, so they send a radar beam out of their radar gun and it bounces off your car, which imparts a shift. And then it reflects back to the detector and it says, hey, it shifted by this much wavelength, which corresponds to you going 20 miles over the speed limit. Um, so, of course, uh, we're not measuring the speeds of stars to give them tickets, but we are interested in that. And I'm going to talk about why that's important later. Now, if we look, just point our telescope at a star and, and look at what happens in a so-called typical star, we might see something like this. Uh, brightness on the vertical axis, this means uh, that this would kind of be like the all colors part. And then anywhere that pokes down is a dark line. That's a place where an atom is absorbing light. Now, the key thing here is that all things between the light source and the observer leave a mark. So not just the star, not just the atmosphere of the star, not just the environment the star is in, but what if there's an interstellar cloud? Or what if it has to pass through Earth's atmosphere? It, all of those things leave their mark in the spectrum. Um, so this big, deep, dark line here is actually what astronomers call H alpha or hydrogen alpha. This is a, a bright line uh, but or absorption uh, in hydrogen. Uh, for those that care, the bottom axis is in wavelength uh, or wavelength in angstroms. And um, all of these other little lines you see here, well, almost all of these other little lines are actually caused by Earth's atmosphere. Um, I typically have to observe spectra through clouds. So these are actually from Earth water. <laughs> so thanks, Earth. Um, they're annoying, but it also means I can make sure my wavelength calibration is correct. So I guess they're not that annoying. So, all right. So that's what a typical star looks like. And we're going to see lots of weirdos coming up here soon. And all the weird stuff, I'm going to go back slide. Um, so typical star spectrum should look like this, an absorption. If you see a mission, it means that there's no hot thing behind it, right? That's the key takeaway here. If you see absorption, it means you're looking through gas that's right in front of something hot. If you see a mission, you're looking at gas that's not in front of anything hot. So those that's going to tell us about the environment around the star. So speaking of solar eclipses that will be happening on April 8th, 2024 in Tupper Lake, um, these are uh, pictures of the sun during totality. And you, of course, may know or may not know, but the stuff around the edge, uh, this is the moon blocking the sun. And the stuff around the edge is the corona. Um, the, so the corona is actually uh, particles that are streaming off of the sun following Earth's, uh, the sun's magnetic field lines, um, which is why the, each eclipse looks a little different because the magnetic field lines are constantly changing. And the material coming off of the star is sometimes called the solar wind. And, and in the case of our sun, if I'm talking about a star, I would call it a stellar wind. And I also want to think about this as the environment around the star. And that's going to be important when we talk about those dust rings. Uh, now, just to make sure you're not asleep, I'll show you a pretty picture. The solar wind particles, of course, 
strike the earth all the time and cause all sorts of fun phenomena, one of which is uh, the northern and southern lights or the aurora. Uh, turns out you have to type northern lights into Pixabay, not Aurora. So I stole that one from Pixabay. Um, so what this is what happens when those charged particles from the sun whack the atoms in Earth's atmosphere or molecules and excite those electrons, um, which then fall back down, give off light, unique to the atoms or molecules that are emitting them. So you can actually do spectroscopy to learn about the composition of Earth's atmosphere that way as well. Um, we're not here to talk about that, but I did just want to put that in a little bit of context to you for you. So I want to give two examples of the types of environments around stars and how we can distinguish them. And then we'll talk about WR140, which is just weird. So. Um, Scenario one, um, let me also preface this. Um, when you're stuck in your chair and trying to study stuff across the universe, uh, you have to basically think very logically and think, okay, if this type of situation occurs, what would I observe? And then does it match what I observe? And if the answer is yes, then you have a plausible explanation. And then, of course, if it doesn't, then you don't. So uh, in this first scenario, I want to suggest, let's imagine that we have a star with a spherically symmetric wind. So you can imagine if you've got my face somewhere over, you know, somewhere, uh, my face is the star. There's wind coming off in all directions spherically. So if that's the scenario, I've got the picture here on the left of the image. So here's my star. All of the arrows point away. That's in indicating the motion of the material. And this is where I'd put the giant space eyeball over here. So the line of sight to us is here. So if you have gas that's in front of your star, the star is hot, you're going to get absorption. And because it's moving towards you, it's Doppler shifted toward the blue, and meaning it's coming toward us. Um, and that actually would result in the downward poke and absorption feature here. Um, for reference, the center line here, this would be the uh, wavelength that H alpha should be for this star is right where my mouse is at. So light can be shifted toward the blue or the red, and that tells us it, whether or not the stuff's coming toward us, blue shifted, moving away from us, red shifted. Further, if it's a dip down, that means that gas, if my star, if my head is the star, that means the gas has to be here. If it's emission, that means the gas has to be over here. So that's what lets us learn about the, the spatial placement of this. And I guess the other thing that's important to point out here is that my, I'm not in the PowerPoint, so I can't do that. There we go. Um, Wow, come on. <laughs> Things are being really, really not working today. All right. Even though the 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 star is placed on this tiny little slit that's the width of a human hair, on the sky, that slit is way bigger than the star. Way bigger than the star. So that that slit is letting in light not just from the star, but all of the stuff around it all at once. So that's the problem is that we're getting all of this light, all of this information, and it's basically poured in a giant bowl and we've got to figure out what the heck it is we're looking at. So that's where the spectrograph really comes in uh, and saves the day for us because it doesn't just pour it in a bowl, it puts it in a bunch of little bowls that tell us uh, about uh, velocities and wavelengths and all of that fun stuff. So our little dip here, tells us that we are in fact looking at material moving toward us and it happens to be in front of the star. And then this big emission peak tells us there is also material on the sides of the star. And then if you wanna get technical, some of it's moving toward, of us, toward us and some is moving a little away. And that again was for this proposed model that what if the starlight is coming or the, the, the gas is coming off the star spherically. And this is what astronomers call a P-Cygni profile, named after the star P 
Cygni, which is in the constellation Cygnus, which we heard earlier. To, it's right there next to Seth in the background. Right, right there where you, yeah, other, yeah, that one. Yeah, right there. So right in Cygnus, it's actually very near the cross. It's just off the center from the cross. All right, so that is how we learn a little bit about the material around a star. Let's propose another scenario. What if instead of the stuff moving away spherically, it was all coming in spherically? Well, it would look just like this, but backwards. Okay, so that one's easy. What if instead, now we see this a lot in astronomy, we see stars with disks of material in orbit around them. And we see that in star forming regions. We see that we see disks in a lot of things. So this is another common scenario. So let's propose what if we have a disk of material that has uh, some of the gas moving toward the observer and some moving away. Well, that would look a lot like this. So on the left, we've got a star that's rotating really fast and we've got a disk of material. Some of that material is moving toward you blue shifted. Some of it's moving away from you, red shifted. And that would give rise to spectra that look kind of like these three examples here, taken with different equipment, different observatories, different size telescopes. Um, if that disk is not there, then you will not get the poke upy bits, the emission, you would only get absorption. And so it turns out in this, uh, this particular example is for a star called HD6226. Another example where I did a lot of work with uh, amateurs and other collaborators. And uh, this is one of my spectra here. And we did all of that, uh, again, with these small telescopes. And what we were able to study is that this disk sometimes appears and then disappears, and then appears and disappears. And we studied the cyclical behavior of that and were able to uh, apply some uh, very complicated models to it that I was not part of making, so I will leave it at that. But I'm part of the observational side, and uh, it was really amazing to watch these things go from purely absorption line to a little bit, you can almost pick out the edges of that absorption line, but the center gets filled in with material from that disk. So that's another scenario. We have uh, spherical, we have disk. Well, and then we can have all the weird stuff that's going to happen in just a moment. So that's the background. Um, one more black background. Uh, at some point in one of these videos, if you've watched any of our videos before, you have probably seen something called the HR diagram, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So it's a plot of brightness on one axis and temperature on the other with temperature being hotter on this end. And the stars are spread out in this little order from hottest to coolest. And most stars like our sun lie on the main sequence, which is where they do their normal fusing hydrogen into helium thing. All the exciting stars are usually these ones up here, the giants and supergiants. This is where your Cepheid variables are. This is where your things that are going to become supernovas are. And these Wolf Rayet stars, this is an example of Wolf Rayet 124. Again, another star with material around it. Um, so studying the material around that star. Now it turns out uh, there's so much material that's come off of, off of a Wolf Rayet star that actually you're no longer looking at the surface of the star as you would normally think about it. So uh, these numbers are really small, but uh, the hottest stars on this example main sequence go up to maybe 50,000 Kelvin. Uh, it really doesn't matter if that's Kelvin or Fahrenheit. It's freaking hot. Um, it turns out these wolf rayet stars, when you look at them, can have temperatures as high as 200,000. But that's basically because they have they have pushed off all of their outer layers, and you're actually seeing down to what was stuff that was deep inside the star, which should give you a hint that these stars are pretty exciting because it means they are very good candidates for uh, supernova. So these stars are very very near the end of their life. They're pushing material off left and right. It is it is a yard sale and uh, maybe an estate sale. And, uh, you know, th that's why they're exciting. So we want to study these stars because 
by having a really good understanding of these stars, we can better understand supernova. If we understand supernova better, then we understand how the next cycle of star formation is uh, affected by previous generations of star formation, um, which is important to things like, you know, carbon rich life with iron flowing through to absorb oxygen, et cetera, right? Life. Uh, uh, these elements are the things that are crucial to things like planets and people. So um, it's kind of, it falls into, that's where this all falls in. So um, how can we study a wolf rat star and learn things like the mass? Again, well, I'll get back to those dust rings and how they are. But remember, my preface here was, uh, you know, popular science articles that were like, hey, no one knows what this is. Plenty of people know what it is. Let's talk about it. So it's a star with material around it. All right. So here's the cartoon from NASA. So uh, these are scaled to the sun. Um, the Wolf Rayette star is the mass losing star. That's why it's got all this fuzzy stuff around it. Its companion star, so it's actually a binary star system, two stars orbiting each other. Its companion star is an O star, which is one of the hottest stars on the main sequence. Um, now, the O star used to be bigger because it has already used up its fuel. It is very near supernova. This whole getting rid of mass thing has actually contributed mass to this other star. Uh, but that's a story perhaps for another day. So yes, a attention grabbing uh, headline. So two stars orbiting each other. Here's a nice little model for you. Um, then there's another equation you can ignore. Uh, so this is WR140. The uh, smaller one here on the bigger orbit is our star of interest. That's the so-called Wolf Rayette star. The larger circle is the O star, the currently more massive star. Now, you'll notice that when they get close together, the animation does some other things. There's some red stuff coming off. That's what's going to form our dust rings. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. I, I, got, I, I don't know how long we were off, but I'll try to keep this uh, shorter. Um, but if you can measure how long it takes for these two things to orbit each other, that's the period, the P. And if you can measure on the sky how far apart they are, that's the A. That means you could use Kepler's laws to get the masses of these stars. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. So how do you measure the orbit of a star? So here's a different star system. Uh, there's two orbits on here and some arrows. You can just look at the circles and the arrows if you like. They're color coded accordingly. So Earth is over here where the mouse is to Earth. And red is where it would be moving away. And blue is where it would be moving toward. And gray is where it's not moving toward or away. It's moving perpendicular. So if you look at our little wiggly lines, these are absorption lines. So this has to do with the atmosphere of the star. You'll notice the first example is centered on my vertical gray line. This one's got a little red arrow. It's red shifted. This one's centered again. And this one's blue shifted a little bit. Measuring that shifty wiggle line, that's how we do the, the star velocity, the star speed measurement. And by studying this, over and over again, we can see that this kind of thing repeats uh, and gives us a sort of little wiggle here. There's a lot more in this. You can ignore this. Um, a long story short, you take the information you get from this line going back and forth, and you can make a complicated plot like this, which is velocity versus time, basically, on the other axis. The time is in what's called phase, which is just fraction of orbit. So zero is let's say here this is half an orbit so 0.5 back to one and you just keep going um there's an equation that one should scare you just ignore it uh we'll move on uh but basically the star's velocity is changing up and down just that's the that's how we measure this. We run some software, we fit this with the model, and then we get the parameters out. That's our that's our not getting out of our chair to learn about the star. All right, so 
Now that you've had a nice warm up, here is the spectrum of the Wolf Rayet star. It doesn't really look like what we've talked about at all. <laughs> uh, so the bottom axis is time. Uh, this whole thing here is an emission line, the whole thing. And so is all of this with some absorption lines on top. There's an absorption line here, which is in the inset over here. That one's from helium in the O star. Uh, these ones marked NAI, that's sodium one. Um, so these two lines are actually from interstellar gas clouds that are between us and the faraway star. And then these things marked DIB are also from interstellar clouds. Everything between the green here, that whole emission plateau, if you will, is all from the stellar wind coming off of the Wolf Rayet star. Now, it takes, uh, when the Earth is orbiting the sun, it, it's moving at about 30 kilometers a second, which is pretty fast. If you measure the Doppler shift from the center of this line to the edge, that tells you how fast that gas is moving. It's moving at nearly 3,000 kilometers a second. So this star is really pushing gas off of it like there's no tomorrow. So it's moving very fast. Now, what happens is that that gas ends up colliding with uh, the other the wind from the other star. And that's what ultimately causes the dust. Now, I skipped through, I measured, I measured velocity versus time. This is what it looks like uh, with the interruptions. I'll just say, uh, I fit this and I learned the period and the semi-major axis, uh, which is on this slide here. So it takes um, about 7.9 years. That's what it is in days. It takes about 7.9 years for these stars to complete one orbit. And uh, they have a very highly eccentric orbit. This has to do with how circular or not the orbit is. Zero would be perfectly circular. Uh, this is very close to one. So this is extremely elliptical, like the, the ovaliest oval, like the one you see here in red uh, on the screen. From all of that math, we can get the masses of these stars in units relative to our sun. So this uh, O with a dot or the circle with a dot in it means sun. So uh, the O star is about 30 times the mass of the sun. And the Wolf Rayet star is now just over 10 times the mass of the sun. It started out with a lot more mass, but it's it's gotten rid of that. So uh, there we have the masses of those stars. So by doing that little experiment, you can measure the masses of the stars, and that's all done with small telescopes, basically, in this case. I should point out that this star is relatively bright, uh, so it is um, about an eighth magnitude star, and it's hard to get a lot of observing time on a big telescope for an eighth magnitude star. But an eighth magnitude star is great for us with uh, those of us with slightly uh, smaller telescopes. Yes, and the solar wind is nowhere, is about an order of magnitude less than this one. So wicked fast. So uh, how much time do I have, Seth? Uh, you have as much time as you, you want. It's eight o'clock, uh, but you know. Okay, well, actually, I don't think there's that many more slides anyway. So um, I'll finish this up for everyone. I know we all wanna not sit on Zoom all night. All right, so let's talk about that wind. So this uh, red stuff that happens is uh, what happens when the two uh, winds collide. And uh, you can come up with a model for what this looks like. Uh, the WR star has the 3000 kilometers per second wind. The O star's wind is much slower, maybe something more like the sun. So maybe a thousand kilometers a second, maybe at the most. Um, and you get this kind of characteristic uh, bow shock kind of shape, uh, which is what, you know, the, the wave pattern looks like when you, you got a boat going through the water. Or uh, I like to think of this as the, uh, the, the, that gross algae covered rock in a creek. And the stream, this is the, the O star is the, the water in the stream pushing that uh, slimy stuff from the rock downstream. So the this is the downstream direction when these two winds collide they make really hot gas this produces x-rays 
the x-rays uh, take away energy and let the gas cool. And this is what lets dust form. And that would uh, do something like that. So here's our, our, our shock cone, and that's where the dust gets formed. Now, if you uh, hated high school physics, uh, <laughs> close your ears, objects in motion stay in motion until acted upon otherwise, right? So uh, once this stuff is pushed off the stars, it's going to keep moving out away from the star forever until something else acts on it. So you make this dust, but it's got velocity away from the star. So it continues to move outward away from the star. Okay. So this was, oh, that's right. I forgot this was all messed up. Um, these are different times. Uh, this is from 2006, I think. Um, this is the uh, UKIRT, uh, United Kingdom Infrared Telescope um, in Hawaii. And these are images of the dust ring as it forms. Uh, and this is uh, earlier time to later time. You can see that dust ring expanding. Very cool, very exciting. And that was the best we had until James Webb came along and did the following. So James Webb looks in the infrared, looking at this gas that's not emitting quite as brightly anymore. Um, but also has this amazing uh, sensitivity, so can see much fainter, and this amazing optical resolution, allowing us to resolve these individual little dust rings. And if you remember, these two stars do this every seven years, or seven point eight years, we'll call it eight, it's 7.93, eight years, does this every eight years, so every eight years they get close enough to make dust. So every eight years, you get this little burp of dust into the universe. So like tree rings, right? Exactly. See, someone predicted where I was going with that. So, uh, of course, you know, this is the Adirondacks and there's plenty of trees and, and you know that trees have growth rings and uh, then you could get into the details of like the spring and fall growth and then that's kind of where my knowledge stops. But you count the rings and you know how long uh, the tree has lived, right? So if we just slide back to the other slide here, right? Then this, this is the, the current most recent burp, if you will. So that's one, oh, come back mouse, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and it goes because the image is a little shrunk here. So if I, go to the unzoomed in version, you can count out to about 17, multiply that by 7.93, and you get around 130 years of history in one image. Um, and to put this into some size context for you, uh, the distance from our stars, our binary stars are all in that little point. The distance from our binary stars to the last ring out here is about 70,000 times the distance the Earth is from the sun. So that's 70,000 times further away from the sun than the Earth is, uh, well, I should be careful, uh, 70,000 times further away from this star than the Earth is from our sun. Um, so that is pretty much it. I will say, if you care for the boring details, uh, this uh, nature paper uh, by Lau et al. 2022, uh, this is the data from James Webb on the left, and this is the computational model, putting all the physics we know about this into a computer, letting it run, and see what happens. And lo and behold, they can make a model image that is strikingly similar to what we observe. And you know, when I saw this, I, my mind was blown. Um, my little part in this is they needed the orbit for this. And so they used the orbit that I helped update uh, in this. So uh, that is the essence of everything I've done. Um, I'm currently working on studying. Uh, so we looked at this little flat top profile where we said it was like 3000 kilometers wide. And there's two different time snapshots here, the blue and the orange. And 
the profile changes and we call this the colliding wind excess. This little bump only appears when those two stars get close together. That's where the dust is forming. This is a carbon line and carbon is a, a prime component of dust. So the paper that I've been working on right now, in fact, two of my students just finished up some stuff I need to update these. Uh, this is a plot of the excess and how it changes in time. And I don't want to get into the details of how to understand this plot, but just, hey, there's more, more cool stuff we're doing with this, uh, even though it's now been way too long since we took this data. Um, so with that, I'll end and thank all of my students that I've had over the years that helped help me work on this. And uh, I will take questions. That, that's great, Josh. Thanks. What do we have out there? I've got a couple of questions of my own, but uh, I'll, I'll take the high road and let anybody else go first. Well, I do see that uh, Randy asked uh, what determines the orbit of the stars. Mm -hmm. um, I Do you mean like the, the size of the orbits? Yeah, so the sizes of the orbits are 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 based on the uh, the masses of the stars. So uh, if I go back to this version here, so the more massive the star is, the harder it is to make it change its path. Um, basically, two points. Uh, if you had two equal masses, the center of mass is exactly halfway between them. But if one mass is more, more massive, the center of mass shifts closer to the more massive one. And so it's kind of like, you know, uh, uh, grabbing someone else's hands and like spinning each other in a circle. You know, the, the bigger person is not going to move as much as the lighter person. So the lighter one is the um, bigger oval and the more massive star has the smaller oval. They're always opposite the center of a mass of e from each other. And then the eccentricity, how oval they are, that's that's defined by a lot of things and and that we're that's a a we don't know still learning kind of thing peter's question is similar to mine uh is there a measurable mass loss from year to year that's been observed and uh, i was wondering if we if we know how long it takes to lose x amount of mass from either the o star or the wr star yeah so you can measure the you can measure the speed of the gas. You can measure the amount of gas. It's a little bit harder to do, but you can measure the amount. And then if you know the amount and the speed, you can figure out a rate. And uh, I, I actually don't know those numbers off the top of my head um, for this star system, but um, it's probably on the order of something like 10 to the minus four or 10 to the minus five times the mass of the sun, um, which is a very small number. So, so in scientific notation, that's like, uh, you know, a decimal point and four zeros or a decimal point and five zeros uh, times the mass of the sun. But uh, for example, the sun's wind uh, is very light, very, very thin. And the mass loss rate from the sun is extremely low. Like, I don't know. And I don't know a good number for that, but it's going to be more like 10 to the minus 20 or something um, in comparison. So um, for a mass losing star, it is losing a lot, but it's not like we're watching it go uh, 11 solar masses, 10 solar masses from one year to the next. It's not losing that much. Um, if you start losing that much mass, you are you are probably about to go supernova. Um but it's a good question. And looking at this animation, is it uh, am I right that when it when the uh, uh, WR star is at at the far end of its orbit, it's not pulling any. There's no dust being pulled, or is it just a, a very small amount that's not really seen in this animation? Ah, uh, so. Um... In this particular star system, um, the conditions for the dust formation really only occur when the two stars get near each other. At other times, the dust formation is not really happening okay. um, in this star system. So there are various different types of these WR stars. Uh, I should also point out Wolf Rayette, just those are two people's names. Mm -hmm. um, so 
Uh, these types of stars have a few different classifications. Uh, there are some that produce dust all the time. There are some that are called episodic, meaning they will, uh, you know, create dust in a big event and then turn off for a while. This one's kind of like that, except for it's regular. And it's one of the most regular that we know of. Um, nothing else has been observed quite like this. So uh, along those lines, I think uh, Randy had the question, as a star shed mass, will the orbit change and could they ever collide? Uh, the orbits certainly do change in cases where you have large mass loss like this and could eventually result in um, some sort of merger or collision, if you will. However, these stars have like an eight-year orbit, so they're actually pretty far apart. So I don't see that happening anytime soon. But um, I studied a star system a few years ago that actually uh, they orbit each other every almost exactly one day. Mm. And so if you think about it, and it, it's almost exactly like the solar system, you know, it takes Earth 365 days to go around the sun. It takes Mercury 88 days to go around the sun. So the close, the, the shorter the orbit, the closer the two things are. So if... Uh, so in the case of something like a one day orbit, you are going, hmm, is this thing going to collide soon? In this case, they're pretty far. But yes, the orbits will probably be changing over, you know, astronomical timescales. For sure. OK. So I'm not going to read the questions. Why not uh, unmute? Peter, feel free to unmute and read your question or, or ask your question. I think you have that ability or Mark, whomever. I mean, I can read the question uh, and answer it <laughs> also. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, so let's see. So did the ring, did the four stars form at the same time? Uh, most likely. Um, so one of the things that we studied in my paper was the so-called evolutionary history of these stars. How did this star system come to be? Um, most stars form in clusters with lots of other stars. Um, so it's it's most probable that the two stars formed at the same time. Um, if that were not the case, then you'd be looking at something called uh, like capture, like meaning that the star got close enough to go into orbit. That's going to be extremely rare and would not result in a star system quite like this. So these two star systems are mostly, you know, orbiting in each other's equatorial plane, like like how the how the solar system, all the planets basically orbit very near the sun's equator, um, with the exception of things like Pluto. Right. But everything else is very close to the equator. Um, these are also very close to the equator. If you get like a completely weird inclined orbit, then that's a very good indicator that that got captured somehow. Hmm. Um so these are then if the O star is bigger, it's going to evolve faster. Well, the O star is bigger now. So, yes, it's it's evolution will accelerate. It's it's basically like uh, you have a small fire. Uh, so the O star started life as a small fire. The WR star was the bigger fire. The WR star has now donated some fire to the smaller uh, fire. It's like basically dumping gasoline on it, right? So now this thing is going to burn faster. And so, yes, uh, they do affect each other. Um, so you can tell which way it's rotating. Is that what you said? They were You knew they were rotating or they were re revolving in the same their equatorial I, plane. So you can, tell the, you can tell from the spectra the rotation direction also. Um, well, okay, I, I don't really know that, but you can tell, depending on the spectra you have, I'm not sure if we could tell from these spectra, um, but you can tell using Doppler shift again. Um, if you have a really narrow line, um, then you could be looking at a star that's either not rotating very fast or it could be wrote and so it could be rotating not very fast this way or it could be rotating like this but then none of the gas in the star is moving toward or away from you but if you have a star that's rotating very fast like my head so 
if my head is rotating very fast, then this part of the star is moving towards you, this part's moving away from you, you would actually take the narrow absorption line in the star and broaden it out. In fact, um, I can kind of show you that on the next slide. Um, if I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> there we go. Um, the, the shape of this line is kind of why, I mean, it, you, it's hard to convey. This line is a little wider than it should be. Um, part of that is probably the rotation of the stars. Part of it is also something else. You'll also notice the line doesn't stay symmetric, which is also another point of uh, confusion in that. This is not the WR star, but uh, anyway. So yeah, you could, you could, in theory, if you have enough spectra, you could tell how the star itself is oriented. Some people have done this for other stars. The other thing is these WR star, these these two stars in our binary are actually pretty far from a lot of things now, so um, I would not expect capture in that case. Sorry, the, the chat has blown up, so I'm scrolling back. Mm -hmm. um, thought I saw Mark had asked. So, given enough time, star system like this will have been yes. So yes, given enough time, uh, the WR star is going to go supernova first, and then the O star will be probably shortly following that. Um, not 130 visible rings. There's 17 visible rings, but each ring was made every eight years. So it's a hundred, it's about 130 years of, of tree ring history, if you will. Hmm. Um, and, and the reason we can only see to 17 is probably anything further away is too cold and therefore too faint to observe with, uh, with James Webb right now. Um, Oh, good question. Uh, are these rings really spheres or do you see them as rings and as you're looking through them? That is an excellent question. That, that is an excellent question. Yeah. So oftentimes in astronomy, um, here's a, this is this is my perf this is my favorite example. So I have a clear glass and well, this one's maybe too thick. But normally, right, you look at a glass, it's easiest to see the edges. And then you can kind of see through the middle. So if you were just looking at this, you would see kind of like in the astronomy context, you might see like a vertical line here and a vertical line here. And so there's really a three-dimensional object, right? But you would just see like two lines. So you, when you see a ring, it's possible you're seeing a sphere and you're just seeing the outline of the sphere. Now you'll notice in these pictures, they're not completely spherical. Um, They don't completely sphere. They don't completely go around. There is some three three dimensional structure to this, um, because the shock cone that was many many slides in the future um, here is is really a cone, right? This is this is this is a cut through like a cone. This thing here would be a cone, and uh, um, the resulting stuff that comes out of this is all going to be three dimensional. That all went into the the paper's model um, here. Um, next slide. There we go. When they made this model, so there is three dimensional structure here. We can't see it. Um, we see like you know the flattened version of that. Um, so yeah, it's not spheres, but there is some three-dimensional shape to this. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming, Jeff. Before we go, I'm just going to put back into the chat uh, some of those links for, uh, for our contact information, Facebook, uh, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, uh, a link for uh, helping us uh, fundraise for our planetarium and for our uh, astrophotography conference. So with that, thank you all for coming uh, and sticking with us through some technical difficulties, nothing that we haven't all experienced at some point, <laughs> I'm sure. So 
Thanks, everybody. And we will see you on June 1st with uh, Gib Brown, who will be back from his travels at that point. Thanks for coming. And thank you, Josh. Thanks for a great talk. I, I, I was right with you there. <laughs> well, thank you for everyone for coming and putting up with the technical difficulties. So my cat says thank you. <laughs> <laughs>